Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. Hello, ocean lovers. It's Rich Gurman, and welcome to the show. So I think it's a common dream or even a fantasy to want to just kind of drop out of normal life and sail off into the sunset. Well, my guest today did just that. Well, sort of. Uh, Emily Penn is a skipper and ocean advocate who is committed to studying environmental conditions in the most remote parts of the world. She's an international public speaker and an advisor on issues related to the ocean and the future of humankind. But prior to her current job description, Emily was graduating from university and on a path to become an architect. And what happened next is part of her incredible story. So Emily Penn, it's great to have you here on Epic, on our Epic Ocean. So you were deep into architecture, science, and art. You were living in England. You got a new job in Australia. And if I understand correctly, you had some time to get there. And preferring to keep your carbon footprint to a minimum, you decided to sail there based on a Google search. Am I correct so far? <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good summary. <laughs> Tell, me, tell us about that, please. <laughs> yeah, so I just graduated and lined up my first job in Melbourne. Um, at the time, I was in the UK. And I think it was partly to do with my carbon footprint, but it was also just my fascination with exploring the planet. And I think not wanting to miss everything in between the UK and Australia. And I wanted to travel at a slightly more human pace than an aeroplane. So I literally did turn to Google to find the answer, started to look for opportunities to hitchhike on boats around the world. And I grew up sailing, tiny little sailing dinghies, kind of racing boats. So I'd always been very connected with the ocean and, and loved being at sea, although I'd never spent more than six hours on a boat until this opportunity to get on board. And, um, and off I went and didn't have come home for another 923 days. <laughs> Wow. So if I understand, you found a sailing vessel that was powered by biofuel called Earthrace and decided to sail there. So tell us more about how this all came together. Exactly. So it wasn't actually a sailing boat. It was a power boat, but that power ran boat. on, yeah, on biodiesel. So fuel that's come from all sorts of renewable sources. Um, and they were on this project to go around the world to promote the feasibility of renewable energy. So I joined them as a crew member and an operations manager to help them organise this tour to visit 120 cities between the UK and Australia to talk to schools, politicians and media about renewable energy. And so I literally showed up on the dock with enough stuff to last me a weekend and off I went. <laughs> How did you do laundry? You had three days worth of clothes and lasted three years. Yeah. The whole other conversation. So. <laughs> exactly. You probably don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for later. So the big question is, on this journey, uh, you made some, some discoveries that I don't think you expected to discover. So what did you discover on this journey? Exactly. I mean, we crossed the Atlantic and I think, you know, first of all, we were trying to catch fish um, as we crossed that ocean and we didn't catch a single fish on the journey. We then went through the Panama Canal and we get, went into the Pacific and we started to see plastic. We went through this area um, called the Gyre where that plastic accumulates due to the ocean currents and we started seeing bottle tops, cigarette lighters, toothbrushes, just everyday items and we were 800 miles from the nearest human being and I just would go for my morning swim because we didn't have any running water so we had to go for a swim to have a wash and I would just come up to the surface after jumping in and just see little tiny fragments of plastic and it just went on and on for days and days weeks and weeks months and months as we crossed the Pacific the little islands as well that we visited and we saw how they were struggling with this huge waste management problem and um, they used to be able to catch their own fish but now they were having to import uh, often tuna into the middle of what should have been the biggest tuna fishery in the world. They were then importing all sorts of other packaged food and drink to replace really their depleted natural resources um, and, and just nowhere for that waste to go. 
And so by the time I got to the other side, I thought, wow, this is a problem that we really need to solve. Well, it sounds like two problems. One, plastic 800 miles from land, like what is going on there. And then the reason for the lack of fish, was it because they had fished out their resources? Is that essentially what happened? Exactly. Yeah, pretty much overfishing um, and and very destructive fishing techniques that we use, like long lining and per seine fishing, um, just emptying the oceans. Um, so that, around. and also a combination of rising sea levels. When you're living on these very small, uh, low lying islands, um, they one rely on groundwater from wells for their fresh water, which are becoming increasingly brackish. So then they're having to actually import fresh drinking water. And they're also, they were struggling to grow food in the ground because that rising sea level had caused their soil to become so salty that their crops would no longer grow. Mm. So a whole combination of factors, meaning the, the, a new reliance on importing food covered in plastic. And at that time, I mean, how, how quickly did you realize that, that, wait a minute, this was all human cause stuff, everything that you just described? I think it took a while. It definitely wasn't a sort of sudden epiphany where I had all of the answers. It, it sure. takes a while for these things to sink in. But I think over the course of that journey, I just became much more aware of things, which I literally had no idea of growing up and decided to go back to Togger to live on a tiny little island in the heart of the South Pacific and live with local community and try and figure out this waste management problem. And particularly the burning of plastic, which was something every island that I landed on, I kept getting this smell, this really distinctive toxic smell up my nose. Um, and as I learned more about what that was, I learned about these chemicals that are released when you burn plastic in that way and decided it was something that we really didn't want on these islands and certainly the kids growing up on these islands didn't want these nasty chemicals that lead to cancer and disrupt our hormones getting inside their bodies. Wow. Yeah, you think if you're living so far from the rest of the world that you would be like just secluded from anything like that. So that must have been tragic. So I want to hear a little bit more about how this all came to be for you. So first of all, how did the how did the weekend trip turn into three years and I'm assuming you never wound up taking that job in Australia <laughs> like how did, how did that wait how, yeah how did that little part of it happen which is a big part yeah so um I really had an opportunity to turn up for the weekend and just to sort of prove myself I suppose and see how I got on on board um, and one thing led to another and you know a weekend turned into a week into a month and then I was offered the opportunity to then take the boat to Australia um, and it was very much, I thought, another month, another two months, another week, you know, as it went on. And then suddenly a year had gone by and I was in New Zealand completing that tour. And at that point, I needed to go and take the architecture job that I'd already postponed once oh. um, to. <laughs> Normally to, when you get a job, they don't like if you wait a year before you start. No, I think, right? <laughs> it was supposed to be six months. And um, and after the six months, uh, I decided to, to postpone it, which they very kindly let me do. And then after another six months, I just thought this this isn't the right thing um, for me to go and do now, because by that time I was then in Tonga on the ground. The issue was so much more than I thought it was. I, I, I think I thought I could just go back to Tonga, this place that I'd seen the plastics issue during my time on Earth Race, that that first boat. And I thought that it would involve a big cleanup, getting lots of people together, sorting out all of the rubbish and then then maybe going and getting the job. But instead, when I got there, I started to um, talk to the schools, talk to the local organizations, the government, and quickly realized that actually in the Tongan language, there wasn't even a word for rubbish or bin or trash, as you say in California. And that idea of throwing something away into a controlled system, it just didn't exist in their culture because up until really recently, it hadn't needed to. And so I realized that it wasn't just infrastructure and a cleanup that this community needed, but it was actually a new way of thinking about this completely new inorganic material. And that was when I realized I need to stay here. It's going to take a lot longer than a quick project to to get this this island kind of sorted. And so um, ended up then at that point. 
calling That's up the architect's office and saying, so "Sorry, I'm not, not I won't be there on Monday." So, what year? What year was this that you wound up living in Tonga? That was two thousand and nine. Oh wow, this is a while ago. Yeah. And I have to ask, so did you spend uh, time in Tonga swimming with humpback whales? I did, yes. Tell us about that. We'll, we'll get back to plastic and all that, but for me at least, the reason I do what I do is obviously I care about the planet and I care about human beings, but none of this would be happening for me. I wouldn't be leading the show and doing all the things that I do if not for the dolphins and the whales. And I've had the pleasure of, of swimming with humpbacks off the Silver Bank in the Dominican Republic, which was maybe the coolest thing I've ever done in my life to be yeah. eye to eye to be eye to eye with a baby humpback whale. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't get much better. So what was it like swimming? I haven't been to Tonga yet. What was it like swimming with the humpbacks there? It was absolutely incredible. I mean, from my little kind of makeshift desk that I had in one of the government buildings on the shore, I would literally every day just see them breaching right there. <laughs> you know felt like within touching distance um and then going out and swimming with them um was amazing and i don't know just overwhelming i think Good you word. know that feeling of complete awe and certainly for some reason my most magic moments being underwater with whales they came at moments when i really needed them <laughs> and you know really kind of restored me uh, into kind of getting back out there and cracking the next challenging phase i can totally relate i can't even count the number of times i would say like the dolphins have not to be overly dramatic but like have saved my life like just when you mm. have hard things happen in your own life or in this kind of conversation looking at the enormity of the problems of of the world and it seems so overwhelming and then you have an encounter with a wild whale or a dolphin and for me it just brings me back to on point of why we do what we do yeah. um so i want to talk about expedition when how long after tonga is that what all kind of led to expedition yeah slowly um so yeah that was quite a while ago x expedition set was set up in 2014 so okay, there's about perfect. five year gap there um so let's, let's, let's cover that gap first then so what happened in tonga i don't i don't know what happened between tonga and it's x expedition so we'll, we'll get to that but Tell us more about yeah. Tonga then. So um, I think, yeah, in Tonga, I realized that actually there was so much more work to do in really understanding the problem of plastic. And not only what I was talking about, the kind of domestic issue, but also every morning when I walked along the shoreline, I was seeing plastic washing up that often had writing on it in languages that I didn't even recognize. And so that got me asking more questions about where was that plastic yeah, coming where is from? It coming from? Exactly. And so that's when I started to learn about the gyres and um, these ocean currents moving plastic around our planet and found out that quite a few of the leading experts were based in California. And so California became the next place that I set my sights on. Mm. Um, I ended up sailing back to New Zealand, um, helping out a, a couple locally who had a boat um, that they needed to get back. We then established a charity in New Zealand called Sustainable Coastlines, which was all to do with that work I'd done in Tonga. Um, but then I was ready to learn more about the issue and I managed to get a hitch a ride this time on a freighter ship <laughs> from New Zealand into Long Beach, California. Oh, nice. So six weeks later, um, this was now going to 2010, I, uh, I rocked up in California, um, quite a shock to the system, having been living on a <laughs> little desert island in the middle of the Pacific. We, we, we definitely have words for trash and garbage and rubbish in, in California. Yeah. For culture. The concrete jungle. Um, so it was definitely a bit of a, um, a shock, but amazing opportunities then meeting people and um, really consuming so much knowledge, going and working alongside leading experts in the lab and um, dissecting samples, just getting to, to learn as much as I possibly could about the issue. Um, and at that point, I connected with the Five Gyres Institute, um, mm -hmm. who are based in, in L.A., and Beautiful. Marcus and Anna, right? Exactly, Marcus and Anna. And then um, started helping them set up their first global study of the five gyres uh, all over the world to um, go out and actually get the data, get the samples and find out what was going on. Um, so with my background in sailing and taking boats around the world, um, I then really led on the operational side of putting the expeditions together. 
and then spent the next five years really out there um, exploring these gyres and doing the, the scientific data collection and um, you know having all incredible experiences really all over the world then um, that that brought. Wow so what a what a run you had um, so I want to talk about the the science and, and what you learned from all, all this collection does it make sense to cover that now or is that more of what happened with x expedition or it's all yeah. so i think yes yeah, some of the, th the things that i was then seeing during those years of studying the plastics issue um in the giants it really brought up lots more unanswered questions for me and so one of the main things you know when we first got out there we really were looking for these islands of plastic something that we could maybe clean up and pile on a boat and bring back to land and of course we got there and that wasn't the case at all and with i mean marcus had built these incredible trawls and we started then prototyping those trawls and actually trying to understand the microplastic problem the fact that the majority of the plastic that gets into our ocean it breaks down from the wind the waves and um, the uv rays from the sun into these tiny pieces that end up smaller than your little fingernail um, and that's what we call a microplastic um, and they cover the surface of our ocean they're now sinking down to the depths they're so small you can't see them when you look with your eyes when you're out paddle boarding when you're swimming with dolphins you don't even know that they're there you can't see them by satellite image from space but when you take a fine mesh net across the surface of the ocean you pull up hundreds every time and so i think that for me was one bit of the realization was actually it's so small and it's also getting into the food chain. We started catching fish, we found the plastic in their stomachs, and we realized that not only the plastic, but also potentially the chemicals that are used in the production of plastic, things like phthalates that make plastic stretchy, or brominated compounds that make um, fabrics flame retardant, flame resistant, that those chemicals are um, really toxic to marine life and to humans. And so it really opened up so many questions for me about the potential impact on human health um, in also a chemical level as well. And yeah, that's so really why, uh, yeah, why I sort of started X Expedition because um, I went on to do a blood test in 2014 to look at these chemicals that are known to be toxic to humans. So we worked with the United Nations Environment Programme and tested these 35 chemicals that are banned because of their toxicity. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them in my blood. Wow. And this absolutely, I mean, oh, I couldn't believe it. I, th I think having grown up in a way where, you know, my parents were those slightly dotty parents who had an allotment and fed me only on, you, you know, kind of really organic food. And I was the, the girl who had to turn up at sleepovers. And instead of taking crisps and chocolate, I turned up with like beetroot. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? I don't know what dotty means, but based on, that, based on what you said, I don't, that doesn't surprise me at all that that... that your parents created you <laughs> right oh uh, i know so i think you know i thought that i kind of it wasn't full of these toxic chemicals um you know or at least the, the least like less likely of us to, to be full of them but it turns yeah. out that um we we all have this chemical footprint that we will <laughs> never get rid of and so that's really why i started x expedition because the more i understood about those 29 chemicals in my blood most of them are hormone disrupting chemicals and actually being a, a woman having those chemicals in my body during pregnancy or when i give birth i can actually pass those chemicals onto my children um, through that and through breastfeeding and hence the desire to tackle it with women and so off we went on the first x expedition voyage ah, um, I, one of my questions and we'll well, we'll explain what ex expedition is, but one of my questions was going to be, why was it just all, all women sailors? And I think you just answered that. Yeah. Um, so let's back up a second, though. So in simple terms, we're dumping all this plastic into the ocean. It's breaking down into microplastics. The fish are eating the plastic. We're eating the fish. And now we have this plastic inside of us. 
Are we also getting this plastic in our systems by breathing the air, drinking the water? Is it only from consuming the fish? Like Yeah. So um, with the, the fish in the food chain, we're actually less likely to be getting plastic into us through that way unless we're eating something like shellfish like a mussel um that you eat the stomach as well but typically if we were to eat a, a piece of fish we wouldn't be eating the stomach and therefore we would probably just get the chemicals that were associated with that plastic that had leached in rather than the plastic itself and um, so that's just one important point to make but but yes you're absolutely right we now know that plastic is getting into us from many other places simply breathing it in and it getting into our our airway and into our lungs um through con consuming anything really and um, you probably you know familiar with if you leave a, a glass of water by your bed for a few days you will then notice there's a little layer of a few bits on top that's mm -hmm. probably plastic dust, tiny little fibers that might have come off your polyester clothing um, or some other kind of polyester um, or plastic that's in your home. And um, it's very easy then to, to just consume that plastic, um, whether you're eating a meal and it's settling on your meal as you're eating it um, or something like that. Oh. What we don't really know yet, though, is the impact that that plastic has when it gets into our bodies. Does it just simply go straight through us and not cause us any dramas or is it having an impact to our health? Probably having an impact. And to your point, then nobody's immune. You can't just say, OK, if you live a vegan lifestyle and don't consume animals or animal byproducts that you're going to mm. not have to deal with this it's we're all we're all exactly i mean it. it's it, it's certainly pesticides and chemicals that are used you know yeah. on our um vegetables on our fruits that's having an impact on us as well and there's now so many pollutants that are just in our planet in our soil in our water our rain you know it's all that, that are just there and you can do a lot for sure by avoiding chemicals and eating organic and um, eating closer to the um, producer in the food chain rather than high up in the food chain you know there's there's all sorts of things you can do like that to minimize it but yeah there's sort of no escaping it completely there's no escaping it yeah so i think it's about mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll get into all this it's about personal choices that we can make to help ourselves and then also looking at the the grand scale of of things like pesticides and just what we're doing with all this plastic and producing more of it so we'll, yeah. we'll cover all this but tell us more about x expedition um it's a it was a it was supposed to be if i understand correctly a thirty eight thousand mile voyage with 300 women sailors that were scientists and filmmakers and teachers so tell us how that all came about and then we'll get into uh how the pandemic obviously affected that absolutely yeah so um we did the first voyage in 2014 and then we had another 11 voyages after that up until 2018 and so that was just this interest growing lots and lots of women wanting to take part and re running these expeditions which were really based around three principles um scientific research particularly to understand the sources of the plastic so not just going out there collecting data for data's sake but actually trying to find out well where's it come from what type of plastic is it so we have on board uh, an instrument called an ftir which allows us to determine the polymer type so is it polypropylene or is it um, tire dust, you know, that might have come from our cars? Is it um, polyester fibers that might have come from our clothes? You know, really try and pinpoint where the solutions lie then on land. The second aim is all around storytelling and communicating and getting this message of what's the true problem of plastic pollution, because it's um, easy to kind of see some of the, the low hanging fruit, the plastic bags, the drinking straws, which are easy to communicate, um, but really trying to get to the, the true issue and the fact that actually it's very hard to clean up and we need to be working at the source is the priority. And then the third aim is around building a community in that there's no silver bullet solution to solve this problem. 
And the only way we're going to solve it is by having a multidisciplinary team of people working from every angle using their skills to to tackle it. And that the great news is there are hundreds of solutions uh, to solve the issue. And we just need all of us um, picking the ones that, that kind of we can do. Um, so, so we ran those 11x expeditions and then we culminated in this um, pretty ambitious uh, project X expedition so. around the world, um, which we set off on in October 2019 and was going very well. And we'd got all the way to Tahiti by the time COVID hit and then sadly had to leave the boat in Tahiti to get everybody safely back to their home countries. I believe, though, something happened before COVID hit. Was there not a hurricane that hit? Am I right? Um, not quite a hurricane, um, but we did leave the leave the UK uh, on the back of a storm for sure, and um, had quite an angry North Atlantic sea to contend with <laughs> by the time we got out there, which makes sample collection even harder than it normally is. <laughs> what was that like? How, how many people? Were, how many women were on the boat? at a time i assume it wasn't 300 altogether no, was it? 14 um 14. so we have 10 guest crew which then eventually make up the 300 after 30 voyage legs uh, and four professional crew so professional sailors and a science lead who's really leading on the the scientific data collection and you were on there the whole time no, I wasn't. I was on the first leg, the really challenging weather leg, and I was also on the leg when COVID hit. <laughs> Maybe oh, I'm God. not a lucky charm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but part of scaling around the world was also about me um, finding other people who could take the lead on some of these voyages. Yeah, definitely. So let's, yeah. let's recap those three. So research to determine the sources of the plastic, mm -hmm. and, and I assume that would be to figure out well, what are the, the greatest sources that we can really address? What's the yes. biggest problem? Mm -hmm. Second is storytelling. Uh, obviously, I'm a huge fan of storytelling, and uh, that's the way we get the message out there to get people to care, right? Mm -hmm. And then third, creating community. And when I hear that, it's like, hey, we are, I, I look at it this way, we're, we are at an all hands on deck, to use a sailing term, um, moment in life right now right like we no longer have the luxury of time when we look at all these issues we're dealing with and Absolutely. it's not going to be fixed by one person it's got to mm -hmm. be all of us coming together to solve these problems so i like yeah. your, I, I like um, your three-prong approach go ahead i think so often as well when we try and solve a big problem with just a silver bullet solution we actually then create another problem somewhere else and whether we're trying to solve plastic pollution or climate change or COVID, you know, you can't just use one solution to tackle it. Um, for the example of plastic, if we try to switch every bit of single use plastic that we use today to an alternative like an algae or something, mm -hmm. we would then have to grow <laughs> an obscene amount of algae <laughs> to keep up with that demand. And we'd end up causing many other environmental problems in the process. So it's a case of trying to pick each kind of problem of what the plastic is trying to do. For example, a, a bottle of shampoo, um, rather than saying, how do I switch that plastic out for another type of material? The, what we really need to be say, saying is, well, how do I wash my hair without using plastic? And that opens our minds up to all of the different ways that we can solve the problem rather than just switching like for like. Very good. And I bet when you were on the water for 900 days and only had three days worth of stuff, you probably figured out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't much hair washing going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's one solution. Don't wash your hair. Yeah. yeah that, uh, that's, that's a great way to look at things. Um, so you're out there and then COVID hit. How obviously this had a major impact on the journey. What, what was the impact? Yeah, so we were halfway through a sort of month long voyage from Rapa Nui, Easter Island to Tahiti. Mm. And we obviously, you know, we're monitoring COVID, checking everybody's health on board, but the, the rate that everything changed in mid-March was just astonishing. And the way then borders started closing and flights stopped. And we were two weeks away 
from Tahiti when that happened. And suddenly you realize just how slow a sailboat is and how big our planet and the Pacific Ocean is in that we sailed as fast as we could, which was six miles an hour <laughs> from where we were to get to Tahiti. And those two weeks felt really long <laughs> because every day there was another update about um, the world closing down. And we had seven different nationalities on board and we had to get everybody home to their, their home countries. Thankfully, we were all safe. We were in our little COVID free bubble yeah, in a way, having a lovely time <laughs> away from all of this craziness. But with this huge challenge then of even how to make landfall, because by the time we got to French Polynesia, they had completely shut their borders to wow, any what, foreigners. What was the general feeling on the boat? I mean, there was so much uncertainty and, and you guys yeah. were out there. Was it fear? Was it just get me home? Was it? Yeah, I, I think thankfully because everybody was healthy um, and we, we were then you know, keeping really good tracks of everybody's temperature and everything every day. So, you know, we were very confident by that point and we'd been at sea long enough that we were pretty confident on the health side of things. So for sure that that really helped <laughs> um, keep the, you know, anxiety levels down. Good. Absolutely huge uncertainty, um, particularly for me leading the team, thinking I'm responsible for all of these people. How am I going to get them all home? But the girls did amazingly at keeping keeping focus, keeping spirits high. You know, for sure there were challenging moments, but everybody came back to each other for support nice. time and time again. And that was just really impressive to see how a team could work together like that. And then eventually we made it. You made it. So I'm curious, and we'll, and we'll talk about what happened with the whole journey since, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, when, when we look at what we've talked about here so far, all these issues were, are man-made. And when COVID hit and the world essentially stopped, obviously a lot of tragic things happened in the past year, but in that stopping of the world, it really, a lot of good things actually happened. There was a positive impact environmentally. So can you speak to that? Absolutely. And I think it, it's funny, actually, because even pre-COVID, um, in January, I had a journalist ask me, well, what do you think is you know, going to solve this problem of plastic pollution and restoring our oceans? And um, quite ironically, I replied saying, well, actually, our oceans are inc incredibly resilient. They have an amazing ability to recover if we just leave them alone yeah. and so it's quite simple we just need to stop <laughs> and little did i know then uh, a month well, later shadowing right there right <laughs> yeah the whole world sorry about that <laughs> <Ground to laughs> <old. laughs> um and and it did you know we saw the incredible impact without having planes in our sky how co2 emissions were decreasing and just without even here in the UK, you know, without people being on Brighton Beach every day, all of these seals started coming back onto the beach that hadn't been spotted in years. And so, you know, having nature kind of reclaim a bit of its territory while we all hid indoors was quite astonishing to see. But there's another thing, too, which I think I feel really um, excited about now, you know, something that I think we'll continue to see where there's been this incredible mindset shift too, because we have never in our lifetimes experienced anything like this, where something is, is kind of bigger than us as humans that literally stops us in our tracks for a year and completely changes the way we do things. And it's really shown us the, the vulnerability, I think, of our, ourselves, our health, our environment, our economy, our politics, because everything has been tested to the max in the last year. <laughs> and we, we've just seen bubbling up, you know, all sorts of issues. But I think what it's done is it, it's kind of ripped off that blindfold um, that, that so many of us had before, where we were just thinking that we were invincible and that we could just carry on trashing our planet, not really caring about our health and, um, you know, keeping on prioritizing, making money and driving the economy. And this has made us all really wake up and realize that we have to do things differently. I, I love your attitude. And you, you and I share so many same philosophies 
one being just just leave it alone. Um, I, I'll never forget when I mean, and, and how fast it occurred. I can't remember when I saw the article of how in Venice, Italy, first of all, the water cleaned up within a matter of weeks because I've been there and it's it, it's mm. not clean water. It's it's a little bit the cesspool y. Um, but all of a sudden the water was clear and dolphins were swimming in the canals of Venice and that was extremely exciting. And so here in Laguna Beach, California, I think it's a great little microcosm. So the coastline right here in Laguna Beach is it's not only a marine protected area, which 14, I think it's 14.9% of the coast of California is a marine protected area, but also there's a six mile stretch right here on uh, our coast that is a no take zone Mm -hmm. i mean it's illegal to fish it's illegal it's illegal to take a shell from the tide pool it's it is a complete leave it alone moment and this started january 1st 2012. i think i'm right on that date so it's been nine years yeah and i'm telling you i I've, i've paddled every single day here since 2010. and when i first started paddling out there was not a lot of fish at all. And I would speak to people that either have been diving or fishermen for decades here. And they said there used to be a whole bunch of fish, but we basically fished it out and all these things happen. And I would paddle out and there'd be no fish. I am telling you, Emily, within six months of the no take zone going into place, all of a sudden I'd paddle out and I would look down and there's fish everywhere. And now, eight, nine years later, we have, t- it is, I call this the world's greatest aquarium. You were in Long Beach with that aquarium. I say we have the best aquarium right here, which <laughs> is the ocean. I mean, there's little fish and bigger fish, and we have more species of dolphins and whales here than pretty much anywhere on the planet. And to me, you know, and you as a scientist might disagree. Hopefully, you, hopefully you'll agree, but just from, I see what I see with my eyes. And I can't, I can't not correlate, leave, just leave it alone yeah. to the resurgence of life that is out there right now. It's just, it's amazing. And I, and I, my understanding, and you can confirm as a scientist that most scientists probably won't yet say, yes, that is exactly why, because it hasn't been long enough. But if you go mm-hmm. to a place like Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, where they've had a no-take zone in place for, I think, about 30 years, yeah. they'll make the direct correlation between leave it alone and the resurgence of life in the ocean. Absolutely. And I think um, one of the re- the place that I really realized this was we did this amazing trip through the Central Pacific, through the Kiribati, very remote islands along the equator. And we went to three different island groups that had all been impacted by the same El Nino years earlier and had really destroyed the marine life and the coral. And we went back to these three places. One of them um, was completely in the middle of nowhere, protected by its geography from anyone else and (laughs) was literally a no take, no pollution, nothing zone. Another area had a very small um, population that was sort of subsistence living off it. And then another area was heavily fished and heavily populated. And it was amazing then to go back seven years later after this El Nino and see that the place that was populated had not really recovered at all. The place Mm -hmm. that was subsistence living had a bit. And then the place that was completely isolated with nobody there you wouldn't have even known anything had happened seven years ago in its ability to bounce back. So I really believe it. Um, it oh, it's so beautiful. simple. <laughs> Just stop it, it, fish it, out, stop putting pollution in. <laughs> well, it, it's simple and yet probably not realistic because there is about 8 billion of us living on the planet and we're mm-hmm. not going to stop consuming. Um, the question is, will we consume at the level and will we learn the lesson you you mentioned a few minutes ago about this was kind of the perfect storm over the past year with the pandemic and um just everything that's occurred and it it really has shown our vulnerability Mm -hmm. in fact i want to read something real quick i wrote something i feel like maybe april or may of 2020 it's short i want to read it real quick and just kind of get your 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 feelings on it Um, It says, I I by no means intend to diminish the immense physical, financial, and emotional pain that is occurring 
and I say this to hopefully awaken, not to alarm, but as bad as this is, this is merely a warning shot. A return to normal would be a slow march into a burning house, a suicide mission. And then I said, this is Mother Nature's whisper. Let's not make her scream. Thoughts Absolutely. on that? Yeah, no, I completely. I mean, that's lo lovely way you've kind of expressed that there. And I think, it, you know, it really chimes with me for, for how I feel about this pandemic. And um, we, we have seen that actually nature rules um, and it's done it in a pretty terrifying way for COVID, but it's, it is scratching the surface of what, what could come uh, if we don't change our ways. So let's talk about changing our ways. And um, what I love about you and it's what we're all about at our Epic Ocean is all things solutions. We don't, it's not about scaring people, right? It's, it's telling the story to hopefully awaken people a little bit or create that awareness. And as we're saying, there's a lot of awareness right now. My, my fear is that um, the pandemic will end, the economy stabilizes, um, all the other things that are happening, you know, the, all the racial injustice, we'll kind of forget about that. And, you know, we tend to just kind of homeostasis, we, we just kind of go back to normal and mm. we forget. And, that, and that's my, my main concern. Do you, do you, uh, you you've, I, I love the term that you use, you, you call this a shift moment. So why, will you explain what the shift moment means? And then you can answer the question of what do you think is going to happen next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, shift, I think, has been a theme in the last 12 years. For me, being at sea, it ma really made me realize how you have an opportunity in your life to shift your course, to adjust your sails as the world changes around you. And it's certainly what you have to do when you're at sea, when you are faced with that hurricane, you have to, you know, Turn around. You, yeah, you do, or, or you have to go with it, or you have to, but you have to do something. And sometimes your life depends on that response. And all of that time at sea really led to my approach to life, which has been very much to shift my course based on things that I was reacting to that were changing around me. Hence ditching the architecture job and going off to work on plastic pollution. And, you know, I think for us right now, this is an almighty shift moment. It is, it's that time when we do have to shift our, our course and adjust our sails and head in a new direction. And I think I share the same concerns that you do, you know, as to whether that will happen. Um, certainly there is a lot of talk about going back to normal. And in some ways, I think some of what we had, particularly the in-person meetings and conversations, we desperately need if we're going to tackle this problem. Um, mm. As great as uh, technology is and everything we've managed to do in terms of shifting our program, it's never going to replace being um, in person. And so I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that. But at the same time, in the way that we structure uh, our economy and our politics, that really needs to change. And, and most of all, our mindset and our values as to what's actually important. And I really hope from this shift moment that the main thing that will have happened is that that reprioritization of, of what is important. And I think it's going to have done us a lot of good in many ways um to to really realize what what is important to us and i think more and more i'm hearing people talk about that i love your optimism is it is it kind of a battle sometimes in your head is the 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 scientist logical side of you <laughs> maybe the realist side of you might be like uh, i don't know if i believe that humans can have what it takes you know they're just going to go back to their old ways and then the hopeful side of you is like no we can do this like is there is, it, is there a little tug of war going on in, in between your ears sometimes? i don't know i think the the sort of scientist in me sees the past and you know is is pretty dismayed by it but i think me the whole of me sees the hope of the future and I don't know, maybe I am just a, a pure optimist, <laughs> but I can't help but feel that burning inside in my stomach that just tells me we can do it. 
I love that. In fact, I want to ask you because it's 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 very easy to get overwhelmed by all the problems. What keeps yeah. you? How is it just natural for you to be so optimistic, or what is it on a daily basis that keeps you going? And I think this is, I'm curious, and also I think people listening that are inspired by you and and want to follow your footsteps. It's not. It's like like sailing. Such a great analogy. Um, it's not always going to be easy. Mm. And you're going to have hard moments, hard days. So what keeps you? Ticking? Yeah, I think it's probably changed for me over the years. I think back earlier on, I, I for sure had that complete love for the natural world. That moment with the humpback whale, yeah. the life at sea, the endless sunsets. You know, I was so in awe of it. And that is really what kept me going. I kept on getting out there because it was magical at times and so staying reconnected now is something that I have to keep reminding myself to do <laughs> and and keeping on getting out there and as soon as I reconnect with the natural world I, I get re-inspired but I think as time's gone on and particularly as the plastics issue has raised awareness and profile you know 10 years ago I felt like it was a bit of a drain constantly banging on people's doors trying to get people to listen you talk to people and they go plastic what I didn't even know that was a thing are you sure and now everybody wants to talk about it mm. whether it's big brands or governments just the general public you know, I open my inbox every day and there it is, the next hundred emails of people wanting to connect, wanting to do something. And, you know, that for me now is the thing that keeps me going every day. The fact that there's so many people out there who have an opportunity, they have some sort of power, you know, whether they run a big company or whether they want to do something in their kid's school, you know, that there is, there's an opportunity to influence, an opportunity to create change. And they're reaching out to me, asking me to help them do that. And that's a that's a beautiful that's thing. Um, two questions pop into my head from that. Um, I'll start with the second one, actually. Obviously, corporations changing their ways could perhaps be the biggest lever that could make mm -hmm. change moving forward in your from what you're seeing. Do they care? And, you know, and, and why? And if so, why? If you're saying they're reaching out to you. Are they, yeah. Do they realize, hey, the consumer is saying, hey, we don't want your plastic anymore. We need to figure something out because at the end of the day, these are corporations trying to make a buck. And if they feel their profit is threatened, you know, what's the sense you're getting from them? Yeah, I mean, I think so. It's a multi-pronged approach for sure. We've got industry, government and individuals, and we need all of those three working together to be able to get any change. Neither party can do it on their own. But what's happened so far is individuals or community, you know, general public, the awareness has been raised so much and the passion is there that it's putting pressure on the other two. And so I think, you know, businesses, businesses also are run by people. We've got to keep that in mind. And there are a lot of brilliant people leading businesses around the world that do genuinely care and want to do something different. But even if they don't, their customers do. And I think people are coming around to that, hence the desire to kind of reach out and do something. And then on the government side, I think it'll take a little bit longer until we have the solutions worked up enough that the government can actually legislate solutions. But what we are seeing is governments starting to incentivize solutions that penalize businesses if they don't try and, and start moving in that direction. And I think businesses are coming round to the realization that it is only a matter of time before the legislation will be there as well. And they then won't have an option. So they'd be they better off being ahead of the curve at this stage rather than waiting till they're forced to do it and then being on the back foot. Very good. So it's a combination of consumer pressure. We don't want your your plastic and then pen legislation that you're saying is coming. Can you give me an example of what what's one example of legislation? You know, what, what can a government say that would force the a corporation to do something different that would benefit the environment? Yeah, so um, at the moment, there's some interesting legislation in Norway that really incentivizes business to do things differently. And what they do is they tax a business on the amount of waste that they produce that they don't recover. And so it incentivizes two things. One, to just minimize the waste that's going out. But two, if they are producing anything that would, would then be waste, um, like a plastic bottle on a drink, they are then having to take responsibility for recovering it and putting it back into their supply chain and really being able to close the loop. 
Um, so just one policy like that completely changes where a business's priorities are. Very good. That's huge. And then the other question I was going to ask you, you mentioned the inspiration of being on the water, either whether it's watching the sunset or in the water with a whale or whatever it might be. You've been landlocked here for how long now? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's ten, 10 months since I got back. Yeah, that's a long time. Like if I, for me, if I'm away from the ocean for more than a day, <laughs> I start to lose a little bit. What have you been doing to still connect a little with nature? Yeah, I mean, luckily, last summer, restrictions lifted a lot here in the UK, and I managed to get down to Cornwall in southwest of uh, England, um, which is where my parents live. And so managed to spend quite a lot of time down there, very connected with the ocean. But here in London, um, it generally involves a paddleboard and the Thames. Okay. <laughs> Now you're talking my language. <laughs> yeah, which is, um, you know, slightly different than being out there in the tropical seas. Um, but it certainly kept me sane. Are there any dolphins there? <laughs> no, not that I've seen. Um, although there was, uh, they, they have had a few whale sightings coming up the lower Thames, but quite a lot further away from where I live. <laughs> I would imagine. You mentioned your parents a couple of times. I'm curious. I always loved to figure out what makes people really tick and why they do what they do. I'm, I'm imagining your parents had a pretty strong influence on you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I grew up thinking I had a completely normal childhood and then I got somewhere in my 20s and I looked back and thought maybe I didn't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, my dad um, has always been the one taking me underwater. He did a, a degree and a PhD in marine biology and oceanography. So I definitely get the, the fascination with putting on a mask and snorkel and, and checking out the underwater world from him. Um, and my mum did some pretty spectacular adventures when she was in her late teens as well, of stories I grew up with. Um, although I felt like I had a very normal upbringing because I lived in the same house my whole life in Wales and, you know, went to school. Parents had pretty normal jobs at that point. Um, but I think it was the, the values, the stories and um, all of that kind of thing, which really connected me with, with the wider world. That's great. I've, I've had the privilege in uh, two of the first, let's see, six episodes of Arvig Ocean Episode one, I interviewed Alison Teal, who uh, was raised by the hip. The, her parents are the hippie of hippies. They built a Robinson <laughs> Crusoe style home completely off the grid on the big island of Hawaii. So she's lived a, a very unique uh, upbringing. And that's all, like you. That's all she ever knew. And then I also recently interviewed Celine Cousteau, who, as you can imagine, and her family was, you know, raised uh, definitely with salt water in her veins and yeah. in the water all the time. So very, very cool. I'd love to meet your parents at some time. I'm sure they're yeah. incredible people. So back to X Expedition, obviously things were kind of halted. What's the what's the plan moving forward with that? Yeah, so we, we've had to kind of turn everything digital um, because we really want to focus on the things that we can do right now than the things that we can't. And unfortunately, sailing across oceans to really remote parts of the world and really remote communities with such an international crew, which was a big part of our mission. You know, we the idea was we, we had 10 people from different nationalities on board every trip um, because, of course, we all share one ocean. Um, so we need to we need to find solutions uh, in a very multinational way. Um, so while going to sea is not possible for the foreseeable future, we've set up virtual voyages, which are uh, opportunities to join on a combination of Zoom and uh, Mural, which is an amazing sticky note app where you can kind of build a whole world in sticky notes, which for someone like me being a problem solver, um, that's pretty cool. And uh, we take, yeah, there we go. <laughs> we take people on a journey, it's two weeks. Um, and across that two weeks, we get together six times for four hours at a time on what we call watches, like you yeah. would do on a boat. And there are all times of the day and night. So it might be social for you at one moment, but also very antisocial for somebody else on the other side of the world. And then you kind of switch. 
So you still get that uh, real feeling of going on an adventure and then using lots of great video and um, actually having the microscopes and all of the equipment set up as well on the other end of the, the Zoom call makes it as interactive as possible. Um, and I think really what we do well at X Expedition you know, yes, there's a lot of really learning and understanding about the problem, but so much of it is about connecting with your tribe of people who you're going to do that with, because it's not only inspiring, but it's also what you need to create change. I couldn't have done what I've done in the last 12 years without this amazing network of mm. people around me who've helped me out and I've helped them out to get where we are and to make the progress that we've made. Um, and so it's very much about the personal human connection as well. I love your adaptability and I love, I think maybe sometimes scientists get pigeonholed as these left brain thinking people and not people, people, you know, you're in a lab and you're not needing and wanting and loving that connect, that human connection. So you have a, a beautiful balance of, of both. Um, one thing that's been very interesting over the pretty much every interview that I've done in the last couple months. And I've had a combination of, I mentioned a couple of the people already, but they're, they're filmmakers, scientists like you, um, Deanna Cohen from Plastic Pollution Coalition, mm -hmm. who's an artist and also extremely intelligent when it comes to all things plastic. So this variety of people from all around the world. And there's been a very common thread in every dialogue, including this one. And it's basically, and I, I won't tell me if you agree, that thread has been that what will lead to the change that we need is an elevation in consciousness. Um, not just awareness, like you said, the awareness is growing rapidly, which is exciting, but an awareness that shifts our consciousness to the point where we will start making the right decisions when it comes to protecting the ocean and the planet as a whole. Um, and like you said, from an industry, government and individual standpoint. So it's kind of like a it's kind of bottom up and top down at the same time. Yeah. Individuals up saying, hey, we want better solutions. And then governments and corporations down saying, OK, let's do this. Um, what are your you know, to me, when I want to talk about consciousness, it, it becomes more of a spiritual conversation. I'm just kind of curious your, your thoughts and feelings on as a scientist. The, the blending of that, that looking at it from a spiritual context, what that's like. Yeah, for you. I think for me, I, I sort of use the word values, but I think it's the same sort of idea that, yeah, if you can shift what somebody f feels is important, then they will make different decisions because of it. And so I think, yeah, the same with that idea of changing consciousness me means that you will then ultimately act in a different way. And the, the shift method, which we use on board um, in virtual voyages in everything really that I've created is really all about feel, think and act. And the first step is you've really got to feel it <laughs> and you've got to feel the enormity of the problem. You've also got to feel the fragility of our planet and the vulnerability of ourselves. And you've got to feel the beauty and the awe of what you want to protect. And that part of it, that real, the feeling part of change making is so important to shift the values uh, that we need so that we can then move on to the next stage. Of course, you've got to think about it. You've then got to do the scientific work. You've got to actually know how to solve the problem. And you're only going to do that by looking very closely at the problem to work out how to solve it. And then the third and most important part is act. But you can't act without those first two. And I think you're right, it does get overlooked. We often go down the scientific road of really trying to understand something and think about it. But if you haven't got the feeling there and you haven't got the will and you haven't got that drive to actually, or the reason to do something differently, then you're not gonna get the action out the other end. I really feel what you just shared is, is extremely profound because we're, I think we're taught that it's all, you know, our, our thoughts create our reality thoughts become things it's we're just it's just driven into us about thinking 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 and i've always innately tried to be a feeling person it's almost like i don't really care what don't take this the wrong way but it's like i don't care what you think 
but I really care about what you feel. Yeah. And I totally agree. I, I think most people think that it's the opposite, that your thoughts create your feelings and then your actions. But I a thousand percent agree with you that it's your feelings are first. You yeah. know, how I feel. If I'm feeling great, then I'm going to have positive thoughts. And if my thoughts are positive, I'm going to take some positive action. And so this is this is really exciting for me because I'm I'm not a scientist nor do I claim to be, nor do I ever really want to be. However, you know, I'm just a guy that somehow fell in love and created a, a, a pretty cool connection with the dolphins and whales. And it's just like, oh my God, I just need to spend the rest of my life doing whatever I can to help protect them because I love them so much. That's yeah. your feeling. And thank God, Emily, for people like you that understand the action piece more from a scientific standpoint. So thank you for, for all that you're doing. Um, I understand that you've aligned with some big brands, right? Who are featuring you and this kind of ties into the storing, the storytelling aspect of it. Um, tell us about that and how has that helped to get your message out more? Absolutely. So we've got some fantastic sponsors who've helped us really make X Expedition around the world possible. And um, they range from, so one of them is Tomra, who is a, a Norwegian recycling company that designed the robotics for recycling systems. So really a part of the solution. Um, another one is a travel company, which is really supporting sustainable travel called Travel Edge. Um, but there's also uh, other partners that I have like Sky and they're a big media company here in the UK and across Europe and they really help communicating our messages, getting us out on mainstream news and, and through their Sky Ocean Rescue program, uh, really being able to tell the story. Um, but the one partner I really want to talk about actually is SAP. So they um, are a company that we all use every day without knowing it. <laughs> Um, SAP build the technology behind iTunes, behind almost any checkout system. You might be buying something online. You know, they work with 98 of the biggest top 100 brands in the world. And so an amazing partner for us is being a real connector to business and an opportunity to influence supply chain and, you know, really be able to talk to those businesses on the change they can make. But I mention them because um, partly because technology is so important right now when we can't meet up in person, but also because for World Oceans Day last year, we launched the Shift platform, which you can find at shift.how. And it's hundreds of solutions that we've put in there and using that SAP um, Qualtrics sort of technology we've set up a series of filters that really help people navigate towards the solution that makes most sense for them. Because time and time again, I was feeling people reaching out to me saying, I really want to do something, but I don't know where to start. Or I feel overwhelmed by the options because every time I open Instagram or look on the news or something, there's another solution somewhere that's telling me I should do something else. And I just don't even know which one I should do anymore. And so the idea of this piece of technology is to really help people on that process of whittling it down from this really overwhelming feeling to just a handful of things to get started on. So let's talk about that. You, you even said earlier, there's hundreds of solutions. So it's yes. like, okay, which I can't do hundreds of things all at the same time. No. So um, you're all about solutions. The reason we created this platform, our Epic Ocean, is, was really threefold. One, to celebrate the epicness of the ocean, speaking to what we we're saying about if we, if we love, you know, we love, we protect what we love. If we can fall in love with, with the ocean and nature and the awe and wonder of it, we will make the changes that we need to make. The second is to give um, a platform for people like you to share the amazing work that you're doing. And then the third piece is to ent uh, empower people so that they can make shifts in their own life, uh, starting with their own personal behavior. And then hopefully that spreads into their family and then out into their community and, you know, out in circles, if you will. So I think it's a perfect way to wind down this conversation. Let's, let's talk practical things from a solution standpoint what can people that are watching hopefully they're i don't know how they couldn't be inspired watching and, and just seeing your smile uh when you talk what are practical things that our viewers can do to make a difference i think that the first point and i'm sure most people listening will already know this but it's got to be mentioned which is minimizing your own single-use plastic consumption 
but it, it's a good point to make because also if you someone listening is is trying to work out how to help somebody else being able to help people distinguish between single use plastic and all the other plastic is quite a good place to start because you know I'm talking to you through my computer right now which has got plenty of plastic within it but it's definitely not something I'm going to throw away and it's definitely not something I'm going to find floating around in the middle of the North Pacific gyre but it's it's that there's plenty of days I want to throw my computer out by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah at the moment um, but it's that stuff that's in our life for 10 minutes half an hour a day that's the stuff that we can totally do without um, and then on the toxics conversation that we spoke about earlier, those chemicals, it's a case of trying to eliminate any sources of those chemicals um, that often you find in cleaning products um, or on upholstery. So checking the labels for stuff, making sure that you're not buying things that are coated in nasty chemicals, um, particularly flame retardant chemicals. Um, so there's certain ways that you can kind of control that. But I'm always trying to help people go beyond just their own consumption and actually look at ways that they can then be kind of net positive you know how can they put something out that really impacts other people's lives and other people's consumption as well and that's where superpowers for me really come in and this idea that we all have a skill set an area of expertise a superpower that makes us brilliant and unique and what we need to do is identify where that intersects this plastics issue and every single one of us have an opportunity. We have a sphere of influence or we have something that we're good at that we can apply to the plastics issue or whatever other issue you really care about. It doesn't need to be plastic pollution, but use your unique power and your unique opportunity. You know, if you're a school teacher, then look at how you can bring it into all of your lessons and influence the next generation. Uh, if you're a product designer, then think about how you can change the materials that you're using for your products. Uh, if you work in policy, that one's probably a bit more obvious. Um, if you're a filmmaker, how can you use your skills to change people's mindsets and values and raise their consciousness on this issue? And literally the list goes on and on. I mean, find me anyone in the world <laughs> has some kind of weird and random skill or superpower that they have. I guarantee we'd find a way that they could make mm. a difference. I love the superpower conversation. I, I, I want to come right back to that, but I want to back up for a second. I, you probably don't know this because um, we just launched it, but we created something called the Epic Ocean Challenge, which is a free seven day challenge completely designed for people to be a part of the solution instead of feeling like, oh God, I'm just adding to the problem. They can be a part of the solution. So they work with us for a week and each of the seven days has a different theme. Day one is less plastic. And so we challenge them that day to not use any single use plastic. Day two is less meat. And then we, it's, it's basically everything that you talked about. You, you, got, you got me very excited about what we're doing. There's less toxic there's less fossil fuels less water one day is just less stuff where the challenges don't buy anything new <laughs> for, the, for the day so i would i would hope that is in total alignment with what you're talking about with just giving Absolutely. people a way to be part of the solution so that's yeah. very cool that you shared that and then uh, yeah superpower so what is what is your superpower yeah i'm i think uh someone who kind of connects and helps pull out other people's superpowers or <laughs> that's what I've been doing at the moment. Um, and, and I'm a communicator. Um, you know, I, I really love to be able to help people see things differently and mm -hmm. particularly when solving a problem, turning something on its head. And that's certainly what, what I give. Very good. And how you say you help people find their superpower. Let, let's do it right now. If somebody's watching like, oh, I, I don't know what my superpower is. And it could be as simple as, you know, we could say social media is a good thing or a bad thing. That's a, a debate we could have, but it does give the power to anyone to get a message out there as a storyteller. So Absolutely. How, how do people determine their superpower? Yeah. So it's really thinking, you know, what, what are you kind of brilliant at? You know, what are you great at? So um, is there a particular skill that you have um, through your job or through what you trained in? Or do you have a certain position um, in, in society, in your workplace? Basically, it's looking for any area of influence or change that you might have. And um, it literally could be, you know, in your kid's school, that could be the place that you could apply your power. And if you're a really great organizer, 
maybe you put something together within your community if you're a great communicator then perhaps you choose your channel like social media or um, maybe that's not your channel and you want to um, write an article for the local newspaper if you're more of a writer than a, a social media person. So it's sort of looking for the avenue and then looking for where your skill set um, works. But the best thing to do is to go on www.shift.how and you will get asked these questions. Ah, very what, good. Yeah, what, you'll get asked to choose from a category of how do you want to create change? Where do you want to create change? What is it that you want to do? And that will help whittle down some ideas. So it's definitely a great place to start. Perfect. And we'll make sure to share any relevant links, including shift.how and, and uh, all good links to hear all about your work, Emily. So just a couple more questions. Um, and one thing I want to say, and it goes back to the, the feel, think, act uh, philosophy. For me, if I, if I were to have that question, like, okay, what can I do to make a difference? Instead of going into my head and trying to figure it out, like I'm not going to take a, my legal pad here and, and think it out. But I'll go down to the beach and I will just sit and I will put my hands up and I'll just ask the ocean, like, tell me what to do. And then I'll just walk away. And for me, that's how I do it. And, and the answer always comes. So it's always yeah. been in on or near the ocean for me. So just just a thought. And that's uh, so good to know what works for you, because friends of mine are much happier with a notepad. Um, for you, it's going out and connecting with the natural world. For me, it's actually having a conversation with someone. Mm, that makes sense. That so makes I would sense. go and have a chat, and then it would all come to me. It, it'll go on the notepad. I, if in this in my in my um, bookshelf behind me, there's it's just stacks of notepads that I filled out over the years. But it doesn't start with me writing. Yeah. It starts with me asking the ocean, God, the universe, nature, whatever you want to call it, the question and, and letting it come. So um, what is next for you? What are, what are you doing to scale all the great ideas and programs that you're working on? Tell us what you're working on and, and what we can expect from you. Yeah, so we've obviously got these virtual voyages underway at the moment. We're, at the moment, we've got the ladies who were signed up to join us sailing around the world um, are on the first set of them. But we are looking at then opening them up to other people that want to join that experience later on in the year. So that will all go on our website soon. We've also built a, a an online hub for connecting all of our ambassadors because since 2014, we've had hundreds of women from all over the world sail with us. And even before COVID, we needed a place that they could all live virtually together um, and connect globally. And so we've now had a chance to build that and are running weekly sessions with that team of women and um, dissecting different aspects of the problem, the solution, setting up working groups, building collaborations. And it's amazing to feel this power. I feel like everything we've done so far has just been leading up to this which is now having this community that's empowered and activated and enabled and off working on their own things around the world. Um, so that's really exciting. And I sort of have no idea how far that can go, um, but certainly it's exciting to, to think about it. And um, I wasn't planning to be in a position this year in 2021 where I was having to think about the next thing because I would have been underway with uh, the Round the World project. Mm. Um, but we are, we're very much in a shift moment as an organization at the moment to try and work out what is next. And there's there's lots of options, um, of, but it's all, it's all around people and it's all around giving, putting uh, the resources and uh, the power into the hands of people who want to take things forward. Um, so one thing we're looking at doing is um, almost like a TEDx model where we um, offer people around the world the opportunity to run their own ex expeditions mm. uh, in the way TED TEDx works. Um, where So yeah, not, not talks and events, but that model of sort of franchising where people could then pick up all of our intel, the shift method, um, the scientific work, the ways of doing things and go and implement it in their own backyard. Um, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's a great when we talk about scaling that's that's the way to do it i love that so what's the best way for people to find out more about you like i said we'll share links and everything and and maybe the the better question is what's the best way people can support the work that you're doing i'm, I'm assuming people are watching and like me are inspired right now how can they support you 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, just get out there and lead by example, um, for sure, and 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 start thinking about the planet first. Um, talk to your friends, talk to anyone in your community as well about the things that they can do. And I mean, to find out more, there's my website, emilypen.com. There's the expedition website, which is expedition with two X's dot com. <laughs> um, and of course, shift dot how would be the places to go online, social media handles, kind of all the same. Um, and yeah, I mean, reach out if there's something you want to collaborate on. Um, of course, you know, funding as a NGO is always a challenge. So there's a donate button on the website as well if you want to support in that way. Um, and there, there's also a get involved tab actually on the expedition website with lots more ideas, you know, whether it's something you want to do in a school. Um, th there's lots of ways to, to connect there as well. Beautiful. Emily, this has been a beautiful conversation. I thank you so much for sharing your heart and your soul and your smile and your passion and your wisdom uh, with our community here. Final word from you. Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. And I've loved hearing about some of the other conversations that you've had over the past weeks too. And I can't wait to jump online and, and have a listen to some of those as well. Uh, so it's been a pleasure to be part of it. <laughs> Thank you. You are a, a wonderful part of it, and I really appreciate you. All right, that's our show, everybody. I hope you enjoy this enlightening conversation with Emily Penn, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.